This is Public Occurrences, both foreign and domestic. And now your host, Michael O'Fallon. Well, first, I do want to ask the tens of thousands of you that are my regular listeners for a bit of patience as I will be going over some information that is familiar to you from shows and discussions in the past. But this is an important podcast that will be shared with thousands of folks in the travel industry, and I hope it will bear fruit. There is a change that is going on around you, and that change is happening in nearly every facet of our society and is meant to disrupt, and dismantle every way that we've been doing things in the past. The purpose disruption and dismantling is happening within our systems, and according to those in the rapidly forming oligarchical technocracy, seek to fracture our old systems and replace them with new systems. Now, those that are fracturing our old systems, like Secretary of Transportation and Gramsci and Marxist Pete Buttigieg, have accused America as a whole— in fact, our constitutional system of capitalism along with free and open markets, well, cultural Marxist and Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg believes that our capitalistic system, built on self-determinism, hard work, merit, and fully equal opportunity, well, Secretary Pete Buttigieg would state that capitalism is filled with systemic oppression, a system that somehow magically favors those with less melanin in their skin which he would state is a system imagined and built by old white men, for white men. And Secretary Pete Buttigieg's answer for this imaginary systemic oppression is the use and implementation of the ideas of other old white men to replace the working systems and ideas that have created the American dream as we know it. And Pete Buttigieg's preferred old white men are old German white men, French old white men, Italian old white men, but with a sprinkling of old Chinese men as well. Pete Buttigieg's preferred old white men would be men like Rousseau, Hegel, Marx, Lenin, Gramsci, Horkheimer, Adorno, Derrida, Foucault, and Marcusa with the addition of Mao. Mao, of course, did what Gramsci thought in regards to a cultural revolution. And that is what is happening today. It is out with the old and in with the new. A full reset of everything. A complete transformation of our old, analog, objective, tangible way of doing things and into a new, digital, subjective, alchemic way of a new sensibility. An intersectional pathway. Built on radical subjectivism and repressive tolerance. And so, the accusation from folks like Biden, Buttigieg, Klaus Schwab, and Larry Fink is that systemic oppressions, marginalization of disparate people groups, gender inequality, etc. all come from corrupt systems. And so, what they're trying to tell you and sell the rest of the world is that these systems must be replaced. Of course, the systems that they want to replace them with are the systems that they have designed. Basically, a toxic stew, or as I've referred to in the past, a pomoid cluster of postmodernism, neo-Marxism, Marxism, and other thoughts. Well, this is the accusation that comes from these men. That is the accusation that is coming from the current White House administration, the progressive fascist types at BlackRock and the World Economic Forum, and the radical subjectivists that are tearing the foundations of objectivism down to the ground. And from a citizen's perspective, the worst part of the past 20 months of enduring this gigantic exercise in reflexivity has been the nonstop assault on peaceful people, decent people who are just trying to mind their business, enjoy life, take care of their families, Be responsible and not hurt each other. These people that played by the rules are being demonized, imprisoned, shamed, bullied, and treated like criminals. You know, those decent, hardworking people deserve a vacation. And maybe they can travel, do a pilgrimage or travel to a beautiful place with the loved ones to clear their minds for a few days. Now, When I first mentioned the term travel, what immediately came to your mind? I would imagine for a lot of you, what comes to mind are your honeymoon and your time away on an exotic trip or destination with your new husband or wife. 
Maybe it was that family trip. You know, that last trip with grandma and grandpa, back to the land of your forefathers. Maybe to Italy, where you explored the Colosseum. You visited the beautiful gems of the towns of the Amalfi coastline. Or maybe you went to the old, old family farm. Maybe you went to Africa and explored Morocco, where your great-grandfather worked hard to bring his family to America so that they could enjoy the land of liberty and freedom and equal opportunity. Then again, maybe it was Israel, where your grandparents didn't have a choice to go because they were Polish Jews, and grandfather didn't make it out of the concentration camp at Auschwitz. You know, maybe it was that trip to China back in 2011, before the social credit system was in place, where the efficiency and size of what is the gigantic Asian Potemkin village truly overwhelmed you with its size and immensity. Or maybe it was that cruise that you went on, that group cruise with the knitting group that you were part of, or maybe the company took the whole sales staff as a reward for a job well done. Man, that week in the Eastern Caribbean in St. Thomas and Tortola will be a week that you and your spouse will never forget. Well, those were in the before times, back in the times before the draconian and overreaching response to COVID-19. Before the reflexivity that took place around May and June of 2020 that tried to massively infuse critical race theory into everything. Now, let's be careful here because you can't blame the massive disruption, draconian lockdowns, the crushing of small businesses and burning of cities and towns on the virus from the lab in Wuhan. No, let's be precise about this. The virus wasn't responsible for any of the destructive actions taken against previously free people everywhere. And of course, the virus was not responsible for the Silicon Valley tech monopolies limiting free speech and the free and open debate of issues online. And if you doubted what those that were locking you down and forcing you to destroy your small businesses said, well, then you were the problem. Well, that was the first opportunity that the federal government and then the state and local governments who went hog wild with their newly embraced Stalinistic powers had to flex their newly formed totalitarian muscles. But now, it isn't just the government that is getting in on the act of the constraints of free people and the destruction of society. No, if you really wanted to reset the world, what you needed was a public-private partnership. Not just the governmental end of things, their powers are somewhat constrained by the U.S. Constitution. If you really want to completely rule the nation's citizens and treat them more like subjects of the oligarchical technocratic monarchy, then you need a public-private partnership. That is what is called corporatism. And corporatism is the precise and accurate definition of fascism. And just as recent as a year ago, several of the corporations within the travel industry insisted that if you wore porous masks across your face, that you would be just fine because of their filtration systems in their butt-to-butt, shoulder-to-shoulder airlines. And the cruise industry was completely shut down over the past year and a half, only reopening when the cruise industry, guided by former alchemist at the communist Chinese-influenced T.H. Chan School of Public Health, Rochelle Walensky, decided that only vaccinated passengers for the health and safety of those on board could travel. And then, of course, as we all recognize now, the vaccinations are not effective in preventing the spread or the contraction of COVID-19. And so dozens and dozens of cruise ships are heading out to sea with all sorts of people contracting COVID-19, people that are all fully vaccinated. And so what you begin to understand is that this entire move by the cruise industry, as mandated by the Grand Alchemist at the CDC, this was a complete farce. And then the mandates began to be implemented by corporate CEOs worldwide in the travel industry, the same ones that were actually in the cruise industry. So if you wanted to keep your job, you had to take the jab. Job or jab? That is the question. And as we have just recently explored on our past podcasts, This has led to the travel industry practicing a form of entryism in a way to ensure that only a new privileged class that you must join 
are the only ones that are going to be allowed to do anything to have a job or to travel. Everyone who conforms to the new mandates must be on board with everything ideologically. You have no choice. If you don't join in, you are out. You will not participate in the company. Again, this is a form of entryism. It is creating two classes of people, those who obey and are part of the order of the new world system that will receive privileges, and then those who are disobedient, who are not part of the new dystopia, that need to be oppressed, shunned, and discriminated against. That is what is happening. They are creating an entryway into a new supernation, a new system, a new world guided by a Malthusian spirit. You are resetting the requirements for travel and, as well, the privileges of membership in the new system and society. And as I had said a few days ago on a previous podcast, the New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern just confirmed exactly what I said about entryism out loud. They are creating two classes of people, the vaxxed and the unvaxxed, the unvaxxed being the oppressed and the vaxxed being those with privileges. So when asked by a reporter she was creating two classes of people, with the vaccinated receiving special privileges, the Prime Minister confirmed, saying, quote, That is what it is. Yep. End quote. And that is exactly what they are doing. It is the iron law of woke projection. They are claiming to be for the oppressed, but they are actually creating the oppressed. So now the travel industry is moving into the diversity, equity, and inclusion game by stating that we're only hiring people of a certain kind, meaning not just vaccinated, but those that will comply with their ideological frameworks that are interlaced with critical race theory and intersectionality. And that practice in the communist literature is called entryism. It's getting inside of an organization, inside of a group of people, inside of an industry, and infiltrating the organization or the industry. And then often removing good people, first by one means or another, but it's getting inside of that industry and bringing in ideologically conformist views that are going to allow those in charge to start changing the culture from within. That's what's happening in the travel industry. So if you are about to change the entire culture and an entire way of doing things in a business or in an industry, you want those that are obedient and that will be willing to do the crazy things that you ask them to do. You are resetting the requirements for employment at businesses, corporations, and in the industry. Now, entryism, more strictly defined, is this. It's a tactic in which the members of an organized group conspire to secretly join a larger organization or industry en masse, with the intention of changing the targeted industry, policies, or actions. So entryism provides a means for a small but determined group to leverage their influence onto a larger sphere, such as what we're going to talk about, IMAX, or through other travel industry groups, by using the entered industry's resources, let's say existing networks or shareholder investment. But entryism is particularly effective where there is a large but inactive party or a large inactive group of people that are paying their dues, and those People might pay their fees, but they really don't do anything else. And these are the kind of folks that you'll find at the Cruise Line Industry Association, folks that are members of CLIA, at the Meeting Planners International, MPI, uh, in IATA, or the U.S. Travel Association, which, by the way, I'm a part of. I've been a part of those groups, and I've been a part of them for over 16 years. Not MPI, by the way. I think that's, well, that's another discussion, what I think about MPI. But this neo-Marxist form of entryism is most commonly associated with attempts to move an organization further progressively leftward. And anyone who is in the coalition that is doing the entryism itself, those that are part of this will be protected and in the club, while everyone else who doesn't go along with this is out, sometimes even dangerously out, meaning that you can lose your job, you can lose your status, you can even lose your certification. And you can see this very clearly in the corporate world under the 50-year influence of the World Economic Forum. In the private sector, where most corporations and businesses that have a significant amount of either BlackRock or Vanguard controlling their boards, well, this is what's happening there. 
So Larry Fink, for example, Larry Fink of BlackRock has effectively been able to place his desired progressive activists on boards on corporations like, let's say, Exxon. And then Exxon, under new, wildly subjective and progressive board direction, begins to disrupt and dismantle Exxon itself. And this has happened in the travel, tour, and trade corporate sector as well. And soon, nearly every corporation within the travel industry has officially been brought into this new religion, this new religiosity, this new way of looking at things with new doctrines, because that's what this is. This is a new, radically subjective religion. And here's the thing. People who have been unnecessarily and brutally locked up for the last 20 months, those people, they just want to go on a trip with their loved ones or with their company, let's say. And they want the travel industry to be concerned about travel, accommodations, dining, service. But instead, the travel industry with folks like Christine Duffy of Carnival Corporation. Well, Christine Duffy's participation in this foisting of neo-Marxist religious constructs through Carnival Cruise Lines is stating that now the CEO of Carnival Cruise Lines is chiefly concerned more about the revolution, a great reset of travel and of all travel suppliers. That is what the now-committed woke CEOs of travel are now saying. Now, For the sake of Mrs. Duffy, as well as the other CEOs of Marriott, Delta Airlines, Norwegian, and all the other organizations that are all in on the religious fervor of infusing neo-Marxist and Hegelian Marcusean concepts in the travel industry, well, I do know that there has been pressure placed upon them to infuse this new radical systematic approach of using a grand conspiracy theory to determine the future of mobility and travel. I understand that. A huge amount of pressure from folks like BlackRock, Vanguard, the World Economic Forum, Chinese Connected Investors, as well as now some shareholders that own a majority stock. You see, I used to be in those meetings years ago where these things were being discussed, more so from the folks that are pressuring the ones who are pressuring the travel industry. In other words, the real puppeteers. And from folks like Ronnie Chan, as well as folks associated with the Riotti family and Overseas Union Enterprise, Ed Stetzer. Yeah, Ed Stetzer's really more of a puppet. Several U.S. congressmen, who, yeah, they were puppets too, and other businessmen. I had heard that this entire ideological, political, and technological tsunami was coming. I also heard this same story of how our entire way of life, our entire way of thinking, would be changing in the near future. And this was 10 years ago. Yes, I heard it from folks infected with Dunning-Kruger-like symptoms like Arnie Sorensen of Marriott International. And Arnie was all in. Actually, I think Mr. Sorensen was more all in and fanatical about the coming fourth industrial revolution, the Great Reset, than anyone else that had spoken to me about it. I mean, there was truly an intense religious fervor. And what was he all in on? Well, It was the same script, whether it was delivered in corporate, political, or faith-based settings. It was, quote, and I've said this many times in the past on many of my different shows, quote, there is a change coming that there's nothing that anyone can do to stop it from happening. If you get on board, things will be good for you. If you oppose it, you will get the stick. Things will be very bad for you in the future, end quote. And I heard that conversation in many different forms over the years. And I would imagine that a lot of previously hardworking folks in the travel industry heard that frightening speech. And to be perfectly transparent, I went along with this insanity for a few years in the beginning, because honestly, I really didn't think that this would all come to fruition. But that changed for me between 2011 and 2012, when I was running the meetings for some of these international think tank groups, and even asked to speak and participate in some of the meetings. I heard what they were saying. I saw the roadmap. And I saw the playbook. And I saw that the powerful men in the room were quite serious about doing this and in full agreement. And what they were saying was against everything that I believe and everything that I know to be true. So I can, to some extent, empathize with some of the travel executives that have been pressured to be mouthpieces for what amounts to a global revolution to push every human being on Earth 
in economic, cognitive, digital, algorithmic, intersectional servitude in a new religious paradigm. So yes, over the past few years, you would have seen the books tucked under the arms of corporate travel CEOs with titles like White Fragility by Robin DiAngelo, How to Be an Anti-Racist by Abram X. Kendi, Blind Spot, Hidden Biases and Good People, Critical Race Theory, An Introduction by Delgado and Stefanchik, or maybe The Fourth Industrial Revolution by Klaus Schwab. And maybe you that are listening for the first time here would be surprised that I have read all of those as well. But unlike many of you travel CEOs, you need to know that I've also been reading for years and years and years H.G. Wells, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, G.W. Hegel, Marx and Engels, George Bernard Shaw, Gramsci, the Huxley Brothers, Horkheimer, Karl Marcuse, Karl Popper, and more than I wish I would have read, Jacques Derrida, who's incredibly tedious, Michel Foucault, Paulo Ferrer, Brzezinski, Kissinger, Audre Lorde, Baudrillard, and many that I would imagine that you've never heard of before. And I've also read every single sentence that Mr. George Soros, and then as well Mr. Klaus Schwab, have ever written. And as some of you that know me, that are in the travel industry, you know that that's true of me. And that's why some of you asked me to be on your boards or on your advisory panels. You see, I cut my teeth years ago attempting to understand the ideological and philosophical roots behind collective subjectivism, Marxism, gradualistic technocracies. Because there had to be a stand taking against the coming cult that would invade every facet of our society. And I knew that it would likely need to start with me. And it did start with me. And while the formal start of the counter-woke revolution against the infusion of critical race theory and intersectionality began with sovereign nations on October 31st, 2017, in truth, my first two speeches occurred on the celebrity solstice before a crowd of about 200 on our cruise to Alaska. One of those speeches is up on YouTube, and it is called The Genesis of the Progressive Movement. Now, I also read all the commendable and liberty-minded authors as well that deal with objectivism. And objectivism is the pursuit to live life by what is objectively true. Truth that is verifiable and can stand the test of falsification. But what the travel, meeting, and event industry has decided to do is embrace a subjective religious view that will never stand the test of falsification. And that will tell those that dissent to sit down and shut up, or that will quietly and passively aggressively marginalize those businesses and clients who do not participate in this worldwide woke jihad. So, what is going on in the travel industry? And why are they ignoring the laws against discrimination, consumer protection laws, and joining a worldwide totalitarian fascist movement? And who is doing it? So now I'm going to give you a brief overview, and to help you understand these things, I'm going to ask that you open the page at Sovereign Nations that will help to guide you through what is happening, why it is happening, and how it will affect you. And I'm going to start today, we're definitely going to need at least another two shows to fully wrap this up and give you all the information. So why is this happening, and how will it affect you? And by you, I am referring to the travel agency the travel professional, the worker in the industry, the meeting planner, the organizations that have meetings, and as well, the average person that either travels or attends meetings. In other words, this really affects all of us. Yes, that is how wide the encompassing overreach goes with this neo-Marxist movement. And again, I will ask all the dedicated listeners to this show to exercise patience as we have gone over a good amount of this material in past episodes. So to briefly summarize, let me give you a real-time frame of reference of the WHO that is doing this from an on-ground level organizational perspective, and then a what they are doing. And there have been many educators or information portals like Travel Pulse, and others pushing out their barely listened to podcasts, pushing critical race theory, sustainability, and other neo-Marxist ideologies for over a year now. That is what is called the operational preparation of the environment. But there is a worldwide, corporate-wide push from the world's largest asset managers like BlackRock, Vanguard, 
and various other financial and political interests that have placed pressure upon industries of all sorts. The oil industry, the restaurant industry, the automobile industry, the pharmaceutical and healthcare industry, where they're bringing in things like health equity, which is medical Marxism, as well as affinity groups in education, faith, and trade. And with all these different affinity groups, they are being told that they have to adopt what is known as their ESG initiatives, as well as diversity, equity, and inclusion. Well, BlackRock is becoming increasingly the arm of Chinese interest in corporations across the United States and the entire world. And with BlackRock's current manipulation of installing ESG directives in corporate and financial markets across the United States, BlackRock will hamper the growth of U.S.-based companies who will have to abide by their required ESG practices, while China does not. Now, China will say they will, but they won't do this because it's actually impossible for them to do it. Because China is a hegemonic nation. China is totalitarian. So for China, the G in ESG is already assumed. The E in ESG would refer to environmental. Are you doing everything you can with your company to live up to the 17 sustainable development guidelines and supporting climate justice in your company and within your personal reach? That would be the E. The S primarily refers to doing all that you can to live up to the doctrinal precepts of critical social justice and diversity, equity, and inclusion in your workplace and amongst your client base. That's the S. The G refers to your obedience of governance, your diversity in your own governance and your support of candidates and causes that support ESG initiatives in a purposely circular fashion. In other words, you had better not support any causes or any candidates that resist or oppose ESG and the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. That's the G in ESG. And this is exactly what Larry Fink and BlackRock intend on doing, giving the competitive edge to China by way of the climate justice or environmental justice or diversity, equity, inclusion road. In his annual letter to chief executives, BlackRock chairman and CEO Larry Fink wrote that, quote, Climate change has become a defining factor in companies' long-term prospects, but awareness is rapidly changing, and I believe we are on the edge of a fundamental reshaping of finance, end quote. Yes, he is fundamentally changing everything, and the more that we do and obey what he says, the more that that is going to take root. In a stewardship expectations report, BlackRock essentially doubled down on its woke capitalism pressure campaign, saying it would increase the pressure it puts on companies on environmental and racial issues. And in the report, BlackRock issued the order to U.S. companies to disclose the racial, ethnic, and gender makeup of their employees as well as measures they're taking to advance diversity, equity, and inclusion. In other words, and this is no hyperbole, this is no exaggeration, This is race Marxism. So in other words, the BlackRock of CEO Larry Fink is insisting that every corporation, and this also includes, of course, the travel industry and those that they are completely invested in, in the travel sector. They're insisting that every corporation adopt the tenets of critical race theory and intersectionality in order to continue to do business, raise capital, or tap needed credit resources. Quote, We are raising our expectations in the context of regional norms, onboard and workforce ethnic and gender diversity, end quote. That's what BlackRock said. And so now, with those corporations both inside and outside of the travel industry, the squeeze is on. So if you remember those conversations that all sorts of different leaders had with me years ago, you know, the, quote, there is a big change that is coming, that there is nothing you can do or anyone else can do to stop. If you join with us, things will be good for you and you will be protected. If you don't, things will be bad for you. Well, if you remember those conversations, those conversations have been had with all sorts of CEOs, boards of directors, and leaders all across the world. And because no one has the guts to come up and say why this is happening and what they're going to do to everyone across the world by going along with this, well, it started to happen. You got to have some people that'll stand up. Now, just like what happens within a faith-based organization or within a church, Men are afraid to stay up because they don't want to be seen as the unreasonable man. 
you know, that man with demagoguery and rhetoric and so forth. You don't want to be that guy. You want to be looked at as someone who's measured, someone who's patient. But when an assault is coming on, and this is an ideological assault, this is an economic assault, you have to stand. You don't have a choice. So, in fact, I've been seeing this happen in the hotel and cruise industry for a number of years, and I've done what I could to have distinct, pointed, non-ad hominem conversations about it for years. But so many are in the, quote, I'm sorry, Mike, we just can't lose everything and oppose these mandates kind of camp. That's what they've been saying back to me. I will say to their benefit, though, at least they are 10 times more honest than the Christian leaders who are just doing this as well and denying it. But there are at least two different leaders in the travel industry. One very well-respected CEO at a major cruise line and another in the hotel industry that I've had these conversations with that have expressed extreme concern. And these two CEOs, they need to find the testicular fortitude to speak up and speak against this massive neo-Marxist totalitarian takeover of our economic structures and corporate structures. And if there are any others out there that are thinking in their minds, well, you know, I just need to survive this, well, you won't. At least your conscience and your soul won't survive it. I guarantee you that. And your children and your grandchildren will definitely not survive it. And so if you're one of those CEOs that I just mentioned, and you're thinking in your mind, Mike, I can't say anything. You don't understand everything that I will lose. Well, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go to your grandchildren this weekend and say, quote, look, granddad is going to sell out your freedom, your future, and your ability to have freedom in the future because he's afraid of what men and women with evil intent might say about him or do to him. And granddad wants to eventually die in peace and comfort. End quote. And granddad will eventually die a coward as the United States crumbles around him. But then again, you know what granddad could say instead? Granddad could say, Granddad is going to sacrifice his reputation and even possibly his life to save your future, our family, your freedom, and your opportunity to live life as free men and women in the future. Please don't believe what they are going to say about Granddad. Because Granddad loves you. And Granddad would be known for being more than just a corporate CEO years from now. Granddad could be known as one of the men that saved civilization. I'm serious. It just takes one man with testicular fortitude to stand up and say no. And when others around you who know what you are saying is true and see what you are willing to do, the right thing to actually be the hero, they will stand as well. But sadly, some have retreated to the comfort and safety of radical subjectivism and totalitarianism. They will be taken care of, and their grandchildren will live in servitude. Cognitive servitude, total servitude. So with that in mind, here are some details in regards to what is going on. Well, one of the largest players in the entire push for neo-Marxism and one global non-constitutional rule has been IMEX. Now, if you're unfamiliar with IMEX, IMEX holds annual conventions and exhibitions in both the United States and Europe to help bring suppliers, meaning hotels, convention centers, ministries of tourism, and nearly every nation cruise line, DMCs, well, they all get together to meet and do business. I have been an invited guest from IMEX and its corporate sponsors for close to seven years running now. And for that, I'm thankful. I am thankful for the opportunities to meet so many folks from all over the world and to do millions of dollars of business, both corporate and faith-based, in the convention, tour, and cruise sectors. And thankfully, my wife, Miss Kathy Kang and I have met many people in the industry that are 
like-minded along with us on a lot of these issues. But for the past several years, IMEX, ideologically led by Karina Bauer, has enacted what is called the Operational Preparation of the Environment. They have many workshops that are infusing forced discussions regarding ideologies whose sources are primarily from neo-Marxism and postmodernism, and have created a adult education of the oppressed, if you will, kind of a play off the pedagogy of the oppressed, but gradualistically moving the conversations in early workshops from suggestions to, you need to prepare for the future of. And most egregiously was the workshop that I had attended in 2019 at IMEX that was focused on telling meeting planners why they need to be instituting all of the Marcusean Sustainable Development Goals into their meeting planning and why. They need to start cutting back on unnecessary travel. From now until 2030. Yes, this was at a conference focused on travel conventions and events. So in doing the bidding of the World Economic Forum, BlackRock, and the United Nations and others, IMEX was focused on disrupting and dismantling travel. Disruption. Now, this year, after the reflexivity virus and the liberty-crushing lockdowns, IMEX has now returned to Las Vegas for their next exhibit and convention. And as normal, I received my invitation. But this year, Miss Kang, who runs Sovereign Alliance, and I were disinvited because even though we have both recently had COVID and recovered, No, we had to be fully vaccinated. Even though we have completely strong immunity, we have the antibodies. Much better, of course, than the vaccines. So we appealed. And that appeal was declined. So the word was either get jabbed or you will not be able to engage in business at IMEX. So IMEX was not really concerned about diversity and inclusion. They disinvited a man who is Cuban, me, and they disinvited a full-blooded Chinese woman, Kathy Kang. This, as we said earlier, is entryism. You eliminate those that could possibly have other ideological frameworks and ensure that everyone at your new affinity organization is in lockstep with your new directives. And this year's IMAX has gone full extremist in their workshops. Now, you would think that there would be workshops on... Maybe how to increase profitability in an unstable marketplace, or how to negotiate attrition in an ever-changing lockdown mandate, or maybe how to create an outstanding event on post-reflexive pandemic budgets. But that's not the case at IMEX 2021. So if you will go to the webpage on Sovereign Nations that houses this podcast and open the link that is titled IMEXAmerica.com, you'll begin to see that every single bit of sessions of all the sessions at this year's IMAX will be exclusively dedicated to radical subjectivism, dedicated to discrimination, dedicated to the elements of applicable critical race theory through DEI, in other words, critical race praxis, dedicated to Marcusean concepts of repressive tolerance, dedicated to Klaus Schwab's sustainable initiatives. Now, We really don't have time to read through all of them, but let's just take a few, okay? Firstly, let's go to Tourism Diversity Matters, that workshop. Yes, they're actually using the same rhetorical devices as other radical Marxist-based organizations that you may be familiar with. And in this workshop, you will learn that Tourism Diversity Matters is a collaborative leader of diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives and concepts that can address the blind spots of ethnic disparities. Discover how to access Tourism Diversity Matters' four primary pillars of activity to benefit the tourism industry. End quote. Now, if you have been listening to the discussions and podcasts on Sovereign Nations over the past four years or so, or maybe you listen to Dr. James Lindsay, you may be familiar with the religiously formulated misinformation and duplicity in the brief descriptive paragraph given for that particular workshop. Firstly, they refer to, quote, diversity, equity, and inclusion as an initiative that addresses the blind spots of ethnic disparities, end quote, which the descriptive words diversity, equity, and inclusion might seem innocent enough, but they aren't. Now, we just had a workshop on this with New Discourses this past week in Miami. So let's take this apart. Diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI. Well, first, And this is primarily the information that you can find a lot of right now on New Discourses, our sister organization. But diversity, in the critical social justice usage, 
while occasionally claiming to be tolerant of differences of ideas and political viewpoints and nodding towards, let's say, political differences, it focuses in reality almost entirely on physical and cultural differences, which it evaluates according to the critical social justice conceptions of privilege and marginalization, or you can also call it positionality. It aims to privilege the marginalized and marginalize the privileged in order to redress the imbalances it sees in society. Now, sadly, they're the ones that get to decide who is the privileged and who is the marginalized, and it is always based upon ethnicity. As well as now, we're getting into the privileged privileged of those that are vaccinated. Now, this is really made obvious by observing that in this usage, diversity is described as a set of conscious practices. That is, not only is diversity something that one is expected to do under a rubric of critical social justice, it is a set of practices that require conscious awareness, which is commonly referred to as woke. So, former President Trump rightly stated, and I think correctly stated, that Everything woke turns to, well, you know what he said. So diversity in the critical social justice usage therefore tends to mean uniformity of viewpoint about ideological matters. So all diversity of viewpoint from the perspective of critical social justice's meaning of the term arises by providing different cultural knowledges, which are only considered authentic if they corroborate the relationship of the identity group in question to systemic power as described by theory or critical theory. And this is because theory insists that various identity groups have identifiable relationships to systemic power that only they can comprehend. So this is what you would call lived experience. And these lived experiences in many ways define that identity group. So this in turn follows because critical social justice sees systemic power and oppression as the only objective truths there are about material reality. So, in essence, what you're talking about here is Gnosticism, a gnosis, a secret knowledge. And of course, this will mean that there will be a heavy reliance on what is called standpoint epistemology, and we'll go into that a little bit more later on another podcast. Now, standpoint epistemology is basically defined as this, though. Standpoint epistemology is the idea that different ethnicities, different genders, and different sexualities create different truths. And that, of course, is the perfect definition of what radical subjectivism is. And so this is how you can come up with a different truth based upon your ethnicity, your gender, etc. That's how you can come up with a different truth, let's say in regards to math, which they would say is colonized and so forth, and it's, it's misogynistic They would say that that's how you can come up with the idea as opposed to 2 plus 2 equals 4, that 2 plus 2 instead can equal 5. And then there is equity. And in critical social justice, the meaning of equity takes pains to distinguish itself from that of equality, which is the word you're probably having a hard time distinguishing it from. Where equality means that citizen A and citizen B are treated equally, equity means adjusting shares in order to make citizens A and B equal. In that sense, equity is something like a kind of social communism, if you will. The intentional redistribution of shares, but not necessarily along lines of existing economic disparity, but in order to adjust for and correct current and historical injustices, both as existed reality and as have been drawn out by the various critical theories like critical race theory, queer theory, gender studies, fat studies, disability studies, and post-colonial theory. So often, though, theorists and activists remark that equity may not be enough because it is, in some sense, incrementalist in orientation, and therefore that revolution of the system might be advocated instead. This is, in fact, the underlying objective of the critical approach, social revolution according to the terms of critical social justice theory. And incrementalistic proposals like diversity, equity, and inclusion are either fallback compromise positions 
within liberal systems or half measures deemed better than nothing. Now, inclusion, in the general sense of the word that we would all use, means to welcome everybody. That's the way that we would normally understand these things, and this is why word games are so important for those that are within the woke community. That is, to be inclusive is not to exclude anybody. But in inclusion in the critical social justice sense that IMAX is referring to, well, it refers to something quite a bit different than extends that idea in a particular way. What it means from their perspective, and also from the critical social justice perspective, it means to create a welcoming environment specifically for groups considered marginalized. And this entails the exclusion of anything that could feel unwelcoming to any identity groups. So this would also be called a safe space. This is because everything in critical social justice must be understood in terms of systemic power dynamics that it theorizes and characterizes all social, if not material, reality. So most universities and now corporations that are under the influence of all this nonsense, many organizations that are faith-based, and some governmental agencies now have offices or officers of diversity and inclusion even in conservative organizations and universities, who are, in effect, administrative critical social justice police. I would say more so like critical social justice Nazis. And it appears that this is what is happening within IMEX and a new group called Travel Diversity Matters. And I'll get more into them on a later show, but I'll do so quickly, believe me. So inclusion also needs to be understood epistemically to understand how critical social justice uses the term. The epistemological thought of critical social justice insists that the ideas of discourses or ideologies, knowledges, and ways of knowing of dominant groups in society intentionally or implicitly exclude others of these that may come from marginalized, minoritized, or oppressed groups, which Audre Lorde calls the master's tools. So this is considered a fundamental form of oppression that prevents minoritized groups even from being able to speak up on their own behalf, unless on biased terms set by those with dominance in society. So as a result, when you start to follow this way of thinking, and believe me, this is really a religious way of thinking, it's putting on distorted lenses. Well, inclusion also requires including the knowledges and ways of knowing of minoritized groups, particularly those based in the lived experience of oppression which would as well be a form of standpoint epistemology and positionality. So these are not to be seen just as equally valid as knowledge produced, say, by the sciences, but as superior, because they are less problematically biased and disruptive, rather than supportive of hegemony, the status quo, and of systems of oppression. Of course, this means the demand for epistemic inclusion generally results in calling knowledge or truth that which is neither, which will virtually always backfire in the end. And so if you are in a travel industry corporation, or let's say you're in accounting in the travel industry, who is to say that your math is not colonized in an oppressive form of accounting and vision and created by those with very little melanin in their skin to oppress those that have a lot of melanin in their skin? And so, once again, you see that IMEX is advocating for radical subjectivism where most of their attendees just want to get back to business and begin travel again. But what they're being told is, you can get back to travel once you take your sacraments and believe our dogmatics and doctrines. You must be in the new religion. You must also follow our woke corporate travel canon of scripture. So read and believe white fragility, how to be an anti-racist, and live out those doctrines. And I'm really sorry But this is what is happening, and I know what will happen here as soon as this podcast goes out. A number of people in the travel industry will start to gaslight. They'll start to say that, well, you don't really know what you're talking about. You you don't understand what's going on with CRT or DEI. And of course, my listeners who've been listening and attending our conferences and buying our books and so forth that we have know that, yes, we do know what's going on, and we were the first ones to actually warn everybody about what was going on with critical race theory, intersectionality, diversity, equity, inclusion, all these other things. So there is no denial of this. But I believe we have successfully shown how deceptively Marxist and Hegelian these ideas are. And these same ideas are going to be aggressively used throughout the travel industry. And when I say that, I'm not just talking about going on a cruise. 
and you will not like how their use and travel will end up manifesting itself and how it will end up affecting you personally. The workshops at IMEX 2021 read like a meeting of the Ecumenical Council meetings of the World Economic Forum. That's how bad they are. And of course, when I speak of the World Economic Forum, we're talking about the organization that wants you to make sure that you will own nothing and you will be happy. That you'll be eating plants, you will lose your income, submit to global digital IDS, and that wants to arrest your cognitive liberty. That World Economic Forum. So here's a sample of some of the other workshops at IMEX. And you can follow along in the link supplied on our webpage. So the next workshop we'll look at is The Good, the Bad, and the Blind Spots, Targeting Beyond Unconscious Bias. Now from the webpage descriptive, it states that this workshop seeks to move the needle to cultivate cultures that are truly inclusive and equitable, but first states that we first need to acknowledge and accept that we are all biased. Once we normalize this, we can begin to explore with less judgment how these biases influence us and to what extent. So the primary focus of this radically subjective workshop will be unconscious bias theory. And basically, unconscious bias theory postulates that even if you are not consciously aware of your own biases and prejudices, an unconscious bias is intact and affects how you are guilty of microaggressions and microassaults against marginalized identity groups around you. In other words, you have some secret sins that you aren't even aware of. This is very similar to how Scientology, the mythical science fiction cult, works within those that it wishes to bring into their belief system. As a matter of fact, it's almost identical. Now, unconscious bias vaguely defines the allegedly casual forces that are taken to be a significant part of what is meant by terms like systemic racism, which can be read from society not necessarily in any particular interaction or event, but in the aggregate by interpreting any disparate or inequitable outcomes to be proof of the injustice inherent in the system. And it is worth pausing just now to reflect on what system is really being referenced here. And what system they're talking about that really encourages disparate outcomes is constitutional and capitalistic. That is what they are trying to disrupt and dismantle. Now, however, it is the system of people's unconscious thoughts, which it is believed they have been socialized into by anything in society that might possibly lead them to have those incorrect unconscious thoughts. And so this, among other aspects, institutional, cultural, knowledge, language, discourses, math, etc. This is the system that critical social justice, IMEX, and the U.S. Travel Association insist we must deconstruct, disrupt, dismantle, subvert, and ultimately overthrow in a complete social revolution that tolerates no injustice whatsoever. But just as it defines justice, which is critical social justice. And as we refer back to the IMEX workshop page, we could go on and on and on. Topics like tourism diversity matters, communicating with cultural flexibility, the global attendee experience and cultural engagement, setting up an inclusive event stage. And most likely, many of you weren't aware that your meeting planners, your travel agents, your suppliers, your airlines, your hotels, your favorite cruise lines were part of this nonsense, were part of this revolution. Well, it goes even further than this. Your travel industry partners that for years stayed far away from the overtly political are going full in for not just the political. They're actually going full in for the revolutionary. The kind of radical color revolution from a corporate perspective that should cause a shareholder revolt. And I will handle this shockingly aggressive move by the travel industry with cruise lines, airlines, car rental agencies, and hotels in our next episode. But you need to be aware of what is happening around you and which organizations are doing this. Because critical race theory is not just in your schools. It's not just in your churches. It's not just in Coca-Cola. But we have them scrambling. But critical race theory, neo-Marxism, and all of its totalitarian doctrinal consequences have been completely taking control of the travel industry. And they are practicing deliberate entryism to eliminate those that have opposing viewpoints, like those that love liberty, freedom, and support the Constitution of the United States. People of all ethnic backgrounds, 
people of all faiths, people of all genders. They aren't just made up of Trump supporters, by the way. Many of them are just authentically and truly liberal and can plainly see fascistic totalitarianism for what it is. So here's the thing. Sovereign Nations, in partnership with several organizations, will be launching Truth Travels in the coming days. Very soon, as a matter of fact. If you want to join in, please let me know. And we are going to address all of this from the perspective that we don't believe that it is right to discriminate against people who don't share your ideological framework. It is wrong to discriminate against them if they're in business for travel. It's wrong to discriminate if they want to travel, because that's coming. And it is wrong to base your hiring and promoting to jobs based upon discriminatory hiring practices. And that travel and meeting should not be ascribed to a privileged class as mandated by the World Economic Forum, Larry Fink, or BlackRock. It's time that we push back on this. And it's time that we speak up. It is time that we demand change. And that time is now. I'm Michael O'Fallon, and this has been Public Occurrences, Both Foreign and Domestic.